you know, what was attractive to me is a system that you have of being able to expand my network, being able to sell without buying ads, and also being able to like connect with people without being spammy. And I think number one mistake that I made before I met you was like, I was using LinkedIn, but I was coming off as like too salesy and spammy. And so people weren't taking meetings. And then using some of your techniques, I had an opposite problem, which is like everyone was trying to like book calls with me. When it came time to sell in January with the goal of having 20 people enrolled by the end of January. I ended up booking like 40-ish calls, I think. And of the 40, I got 15 people signed up at $5,000 each for an eight-week program. Half of these people are people that I had some kind of prior relationship with. I don't know that without your strategy, I would have been able to get them signed up for a thing. I wanted to introduce my good friend and client, Rhea Wong, and she's a bit of a badass. I um, worked with her, uh, I think, mid to late last year. Remind me exactly when we started, Rhea. we started in October. Like September, yes. late September, early October. Yeah, so like late last year. And um, at the time she was, uh, you know, pretty successful. She had built a solid consulting business, but it wasn't fully digitized. It was still very much more of the done for you consulting one-on-one -on -one model, not particularly scalable. And of course it's limiting both in terms of how much revenue you can bring in because you can't really serve that many clients with that model, but also uh, it takes up a lot of time. And to a degree, it's a bit more of a frustrating process working so intensely with clients. And um, most recently, she had herself a pretty good January. January was her launch month for her new digital focused product. And tell us how you did in January with your revenue. Well, um, yeah, I actually cleared 90K in January, which was like more than double my best month to date. So really there happy about that. Snaps, snaps for that, even though it's just me and you. Whenever we do our, uh, uh, our group mastermind calls, I typically like to do snaps and get everyone to snap, but it's just you and I today. <laughs> So I, I wanted to, you know, introduce you guys to Rhea real quick. Um, she's a total rock star and we're going to be sharing her story um, all the way from inception of before she set up her product launch and what she was struggling with, with the consulting side. And then also how she migrated to a bit more of a digital focused offering and how we actually went about launching the product and generating um, such an awesome January. So with that being said, I want to give you some time to shine as well. Why don't you share with the audience real quick about your story? Um, what it is that you do in terms of your work and for your clients, the problems that you're solving. And uh, yeah, like how, how you even really got into this world to begin with. Tell yeah. All the yeah. Good question. So um, where to begin? So I uh, am, was an executive director of a nonprofit here in New York City. Uh, so I started in 2005 and I was an ED for 12 and a half years. And through that time, I built my organization from $250,000 a year up to $3 million in private fundraising annually. And so I was like, okay, I figured out this fundraising thing. Um, fast forward, when I left my organization, I started consulting. And you know, I think similar to a lot of consultants, I kind of took on a lot of different projects. And, and you know, it was like I had a pretty wide network. So I was doing like strategic planning jobs and like, you know, talent management projects, et cetera, et cetera. And then I realized that like, why am I messing around with all this stuff when I have this rock star ability? Like I know how to fundraise. And I think for a lot of nonprofits, that is their number one problem. They're, they don't know how to fundraise. They never have enough money. They don't really have processes, et cetera. So in, let me see, uh, 2018, I took on a consulting gig for a nonprofit. And essentially, I was like their in-house interim development person helping out with fundraising. And I was like, oh, this, this is not for me. Because to your point, like being in-house, doing done-for-you consulting is like kind of annoying. So I had this idea of doing a group coaching program uh, in part because, I mean, you know, my services are pretty expensive and for nonprofits and especially for small nonprofits, and that, I define that as nonprofits under about a million and a half per year, you know, it, it's not really tenable to be able to work with me one on one. And so, um, so what I did in, I guess it was August, is I launched a beta program of my group coaching program, which I thought would be you know, just a way to test out the concept. 
at the time I was charging like $500 for a seven week program. So like not very much at all, but even still, I felt like I was having a really hard time getting people to sign up for it. And so a lot of the people who signed up were already in my network, but I really wanted a way to reach out to like that next level of people, which, you know, is how I found you, Lloyd. And I was like, oh, you know, we, I looked at your stuff. We talked a little bit and, you know, what was attractive to me is a system that you have of, being able to expand my network, being able to sell without buying ads and also being able to like connect with people without being spammy. And I think num the number one mistake that I made before I met you was like, I was using LinkedIn, but I was coming across as like too salesy and spammy. And so people like weren't taking meetings and then using some of your techniques, <laughs> I had an opposite problem, which is like everyone was trying to like book calls with me. So, the other thing I will say is like, I, I have built up kind of a brand within the nonprofit community. So when people saw that, I was like, Hey, you want to have a coffee? They were like, yes. And I was like, oh, hold on. Wait, I don't even know if you have like a problem with fundraising yet. Um, and then the other piece is I've had a podcast based on nonprofit fundraising or nonprofits in general for about two years. So I have some brand recognition around that. So when it came time to sell in January, so I opened the cart, so to speak, in January with the goal of having uh, 20 people enrolled by the end of January. And, you know, I ended up booking like 40-ish calls, I think. And of the 40, I got 15 people signed up at $5,000 each for, it's now an eight-week program. Lovely. I love it. So for everyone here who is listening because you just want to listen about the biz dev side, how we book the meetings, how we close the deals, Bear with me, we're gonna get there. But before we get there, we have to talk about how we actually led up to that point because that is what will allow us to have a bit of a more complete picture. So let's go back in time, right? Um, you were kind of in the initial period of crafting your offer. What was it that we had spoken together um, that really allowed us to figure out like the best way to set up the offer itself um, in terms of how long it should be or like the way in which the servicing is going to be. Of course, at that point in time, you had been strictly doing one-on-one -on -one consulting, coaching, mm -hmm. um, done for you. So it's a bit of a migration, right? So what was your thought process and actually the offer creation side of things um, so that people get a sense of, of just our strategy there? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, um, I don't think you and I really talked about crafting the offer because I had already created the offer prior to meeting you. Um, you know, I, I did make some tweaks in the offer based on our conversation, but I mean, my offer, and again, this may be different from some of the folks you're working with, but like, I already had deep expertise in this particular mm -hmm. sector. I mean, I've been in this sector for 15 years, so I kind of already knew the pain points. That being said, though, I think where you were helpful was thinking about how you tweak the offer based on the conversations that you're having and based on identifying the pain points of my potential client. And then the other piece that was really helpful is being able to pre-identify people. So I wasn't wasting time with people on the line who were like, I knew we're not gonna be interested or I knew couldn't afford what I was offering. Um, Cause before we met, when I was on the line doing a lot of these like strategy sessions, I was like talking to people who were like, there was no way they could afford what I was offering or like couldn't even, really make use of it because they were just starting out and like what I'm what I'm teaching is like fairly sophisticated or at least you have to have like some you know history of fundraising in order to really maximize my knowledge so I think it was less about help crafting the offer and more about like making it attractive to the right audience yeah so I wasn't even necessarily trying to take credit for some of the offer construction I was just trying to keep uh think about how you set up your offer um, because there's a lot of people listening to this that are potentially in the migration period of yeah. moving from consulting or done for you into a bit more of a digitized uh, type of program. So even, even if I wasn't as much in the, in the process there, because you had already done a lot of the work, of course, I, I think we talked a lot about the servicing side in terms of how you maintain your coaching. Is it going to be pure group or if it's going to be like pure course or whatnot? We, I think we talked a little bit more about that more so than the actual content inside your program. Yeah. So tell, <laughs> well, tell us a little bit more about like the servicing side, how you like were thinking about how to set up the servicing side, but also um, if, if you were 
wanting to share some of the stuff about the creation of the, the, the content or whatnot, you can share about that too. Yeah. So the content, again, was really based on, you know, my experience of like what I think is absolutely necessary to build a good individual donor program. So again, you know, I think that's really based on experience. So I would say, you know, folks out there who are moving from consulting into the coaching space, like just think about the clients that you've worked with and like what are the pitfalls that you've seen them or like what sort of projects have you worked on that you're like, oh yeah, that like that could translate to something that more people would need to know. So that's the first thing. So the second thing is, it's actually interesting. I'm doing I'm doing what you told me not to do. So my original beta was a cohort model. So I had I had like video content, and then every Friday we would meet and discuss the content. And in my beta program, I had 12 people in that. And they, you know, the fact is like once I did the post experience surveys, the thing that kept coming up again and again is like, oh, I really like the cohort model. I really like, you know, talking with my peers. And then you and I talked about that because I think it does bottleneck me a little bit because if, if I'm trying to create like a small group experience, it's going to be hard to do that at scale. So I think that's my next challenge to figure out. So in this next iteration, um, I am, using a different platform to drip content. And I'm actually doing it week by week. So one thing that you and I talked about was like, don't stress out about like creating the whole course first and then and then selling it, just like get enough ahead to be able to give them like a couple, you know, know that you have like a couple weeks ready to go um, and then sort of create as you go, because actually in many ways that will be more responsive to like the issues that come up in the calls. So I have content, which, you know, call it about 20 minutes of content per week, plus, you know, some some assignments that they have to do. And then they come to the sessions on Fridays for 90 minutes to work on the assignments. And then I have a Slack channel. like So if questions come up throughout the week, I'm available. Plus, I've also done accountability partners. So I've matched them up to, like, you know, keep each other accountable. Yeah, I like that. And and obviously there isn't a single best way to do things. I don't do the cohort model because as you had referenced, it is a little bit harder to scale when, when you can only really start a pack of people when the next group is meant to start together. For me, I do it more evergreen so people can join whatever they want. But like the reason why you did it is because of a couple of things that we had talked about. First, you listen to the feedback from your customers and your prospects, and that's what they wanted. So that's something that I always talk to my clients about. It's like, make the decisions around your product development, around what you feel your clients most want. And when I say what you feel, I don't mean just like your gut feeling, but I mean talking to them and actually asking them, what is it that you really want out of a great client experience? And the second thing that I talk about all the time with everyone, not just my clients, is that you want to make sure that you are still prioritizing customer experience. Mm -hmm. Because if you prioritize the scaling of your program, more than the experience of your program, then even if technically you can scale, you'll never have enough customers to even get to that point where you're bottlenecking, Mm -hmm. right? Because scale requires that you have a lot of demand. Mm -hmm. And even for me, I still do a lot of one-on-one consulting, not just because I enjoy it, but because I know it does more, it just gets better results for my clients. Mm -hmm. Um, And people always say, oh, don't do one-on-one, just do pure group. But in my experience, no one really enjoys pure group coaching that much because it's much less... Um, tailored, you're getting a bit of a generic copy and paste type of experience. It's not as accountable. So for me, I still do decisions. I still have decisions from the fulfillment standpoint that isn't as like scalable as some other models. But for me, it's because I still prioritize client experience first. And you did the same. So um, that's that's totally good. Like I, I think it's it's a solid approach that you took. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is pricing. And we did talk a lot about pricing. Oh my God, we talked so much about pricing. Yeah, go ahead. I feel as though we went for a month and a half in our calls, just talking about how to best price this thing. And yep. you had not just some tactical questions of like, okay, how do I position it then? Um, but you also had some mental roadblocks, I feel, from like, ah, are they going to buy it? Yeah. Like, ah, it's a bit of a, like a big ask. So, so talk us through about how we work together to arrive in the appropriate pricing, both in terms of the tactics, but also in terms of overcoming some mental barriers that you might have had before um, due to just, you know, life experiences that you, you know, had gone through. 
Yeah, so it's a, it's a good question. So I think my main issue about barriers were really two things. So number one, that I felt like I had a hard time selling out the course at the $500 pricing level. So I was like, so if it's hard at 500, how could it possibly not be hard, like 10 times as hard at 5,000, right? So there was that piece. And then the other piece is really my network or like my sector, which like everyone says that they say that their sector doesn't have any money, but like nonprofits literally do not have money, right? I'm like, it's in the name. <laughs> so, you know, I know that my sector in particular is really price sensitive. And, you know, you and I went back and forth on this. And initially I was like, okay, $5,000 is, is the thing. And then, and I was like, oh, but like, what if I don't sell at 5,000? So maybe like 3,000 is better. And then I just kind of had this moment uh, and maybe it was during one of our, our mastermind calls where I was like, you know what, screw it. Let's try 5,000. And if, you know, if I'm not getting any bites after a certain point then I can like scale it back, but like, let's just go for it. And you know, the thing that I kind of had to come to was realizing that like I am offering way more than $5,000 worth of value. And part of it was I was able to go back to the beta group and get testimonials like, hey, how much more did you raise working with me? And, you know, I have one of my my former students, Marley, who said that like, you know, their goal this year for their end of year campaign was to raise $50,000, but then she used some of my techniques and they ended up raising $150,000. And I was like, well, that's definitely worth $5,000. So, you know, being able to use her testimonial and part of it was just like confidence in, in what I was selling and really kind of just helped. Um, and look, I'll be honest with you. There was, I mean, are we going to talk about sales or? I mean, we, we can talk about sales for sure. Um, but we can also go into like, if there's anything else that you want to talk about in terms of how we arrived at our pricing, but also like the tactics that we utilize to make sure that, okay, if we are to pitch pricing, we're going to do it in this way um, to make sure that we have like a negotiation strategy. We have a fallback plan. Like yeah. tell us anything that you want about pricing. And if there's nothing left, then we can just go into the actual sales process. Yeah. I mean, you know, what was interesting is like, you know, it, it, it um, so, you know, Lloyd, your thing is like, you don't put the pricing on the website, right? So like, there are definitely people who are like, well, before I get on the phone with you, like, I need to know how much this is. Um, and so my pushback was always like, well, what, can we just like, let's just hop on the phone first. Because I think part of it was like, you had to know what I was yeah. offering. As that's why we don't have it on the website. We use it as like a curiosity trigger so that you can get them on a call right. or on the call much easier for you to justify the pricing. Cause as you said, um, if someone's like a nonprofit, they already have minimal money to begin with. If they see the price tag, they're not, they're going to click delete before they even give you a chance to explain why it's worth 10 times that. So right. for anyone who's thinking about like selling a high, high, high ticket product, unless it's such an obvious, Oh, like I totally get why it's worth it. I typically would not recommend having a website already having the pricing. You would be better off explaining it on the call where you can justify it. So yeah. that people have stickers show up. But please continue. Yeah. So so that was the that was that. And then I went in uh with five thousand as like, you know, this is the price. Um and then what I did was have, you know, to your point, a couple of like backup scenarios. Cause like there were like definitely like two people I talked to who I sold to who initially were like, oh no, I can't do that. And then I was like, okay, well, you know, we can talk about, um, you know, a payment plan. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh yeah, okay. Like offering that definitely made it possible. And like sealed, cause I feel like people get locked in and say, give like $5,000, but they're not thinking about like, well, how do I, how do I make it possible in my budget? I think having that was helpful. And then the other piece is I also offered, um, like a discount if they could commit within, you know, like 24 hours. So, you know, having those kind of things um, was helpful. And then, you know, and then I think the idea of having like a walk away price was really helpful too. It, so for like a couple of people, I threw in some extra things like, you know, I have two clients who I, I hope my clients don't watch this. But, don't, don't say names, don't use names. No, I know. But like a couple of the clients like have, pretty unique situations and I'm like um you're probably going to need some extra coaching because 
like the full scope of your issue is not going to be covered in this. So I, you know, threw in like a couple extra like one-on-one -on -one sessions to be like, okay, I just like, cause I really need to just make sure that you get maximum value. Um, and then of course, like the walk away price, if someone was like unwilling to go over a certain limit, I was like, you know, maybe then it's just like not right for us to work together. And like, that's fine. It's not personal, but like, you know, I, I know what I'm offering. I know what it's worth. And if like, you can't find that to take your fundraising to the next level, then maybe it's just not right for us. Yeah. So a couple of takeaways that I want everyone to get from what you had just said, Rhea, I mean, because obviously when, when people join my program, we talk so much about negotiations, pricing strategy, um, positioning, making sure that you have like a very good process of at the end of the sales cycle, making sure that you're able to close the deal at the highest value possible. So yeah, having a walkaway price is so critical when you're negotiating, because if you don't, people are just going to whittle you down and you need to have like an, a place where you are just going to stand behind the value of your offer and just like, you know what, you're offering me $2,000. And of course I would like the $2,000, but it just like, I am worth more than that. And I would rather say no than to take it and devalue my offer, devalue my brand when it should be giving you like 20, 30 times that value in return. Um, well, and then also, oh, yeah. well, I was also going to say for me, it's also a question of fairness, which is like, why yeah. should all these other people pay five and you pay like less than half when it's the same experience. Like it just doesn't seem fair. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's also why we, we talk about the negotiation ladder, the negotiation waterfall, if you will. Um, that's the way in which I, I kind of will verbalize it, but what it is. And, and we talk about this with all of our clients is if people are asking you, you know what, like I want a better price or I don't feel comfortable. Like what can you do outside of just, whittling your price down that could still get the deal done. Is it okay, we'll give you a discount, but in exchange for you to sign now, which for us is worth it. Or what if it's the same price, but we give you a bit more, I would almost always rather charge the same price, but give them a bit more than to just charge less and give them the same amount of stuff. Right? So there's other options and alternatives that I think are just better in, in the process of negotiation that doesn't necessarily have to whittle down the price. Um, the only thing that I'm really okay with in terms of whittling down the price on is if they sign up faster because I'm willing to pay a little bit if it means that I shorten the sales cycle. But other than that, like I'm almost always going to try to maintain the value of the, the program and the pricing. And if that means I have to give up a little bit more value, then that's what it is. It is like, I'm, I'm okay with that. Yeah. I mean, two things too, that like really jumped out here is, you know, I, I have a fundraising background. So like being able to say big numbers is like part of the job, but say the number and then just shut up. Cause I think yeah. sometimes like yeah. people get nervous and then they jump in like, well, I know this is like a lot of money. And it's like, just stop talking, let them talk. Don't justify it. Like you, you, if you stand behind your pricing, there's no need to justify it. You just say it and you mean it. Yeah. I think there's that. And then the other piece for me that I just wanted to flag is, and, and this is like fairly unique to me, but you know, most of the time I couldn't get people to say yes right then and there because they have a board and they usually had to go and like get board approval in order to you know, to get this written into a budget if it had been pre-budgeted. So like that's just, but that, you know, that's a unique situation to me, but obviously yes, if like there was a way to get to an immediate yes on the phone, like do that. Yeah, for sure. And, um, we're not going to be able to like go into the intricacies of selling to a team with multiple stakeholders in this call, but it's just one of those things that, yeah, you have to be a bit more considerate of not just the person that you're talking to and their motivations, but also what is the motivation of everyone else in the team? Are you willing to ask the person that you're talking to like, Oh, who else in your team is involved in this decision? What do they care about? Like, are, are they going to value certain things? Are they going to not value certain things? Cause you need to be able to, make sure that everyone is aligned with the uh, project if you are selling to a greater team. And I come from like a software background where we sold to big teams. So um, it's just something that I think about all the time, the bigger um, the scope of the project is, and it's something you also are familiar with as well. I'm not exactly certain if we talked about that too much in our calls, but I wouldn't be surprised if we did touch on that once. In, once in. I mean, we touched on it. So one thing that I did was, um, 
you know, I would talk to usually the executive director, but what I would do is I created an FAQ. I mean, Lloyd, you said do a deck, but I was like, I can't do a deck for everyone. So I just did like an FAQ for like what your board members may ask. And it's like, hey, this seems really expensive. What's the ROI? Or like, how do we know that she knows what she's talking about? Whatever it may be. So, uh, or like, what, what's the proof that she knows what she's doing? Um, so I send that with them, like, hey, listen, I put together an FAQ that could be helpful when you talk to your board and like help them to anticipate the, the things that their board might say. And that, that's been helpful. Yeah, actually, I do remember telling you to make a deck. But I mean, a deck, an FAQ, it's more or less the same thing, right? It, it accomplishes the same end outcome, which is, um, a way for your champion. So for anyone who doesn't know what a champion is, it's the main point of contact in the sales opportunity. So you meet someone and you're asking them to sell to the rest of their team. Well, an FAQ or a deck that your champion can use to sell internally um, is, is a really effective way of, of being able to just get the rest of the team on board, even if you're not physically there or virtually there because they can't all jump in the same room on a Zoom call with you. So yeah, that's definitely something that I, I remember us talking about. So with that being said, um, it's you know time for us to talk about the big thing. Let's talk about sales. Let's talk about how we actually got a ton of meetings. You, you had referenced like early in this conversation that you weren't getting many meetings at all outside of the people in your network. But then after we started working together, one of the biggest lifts was of course just booking more meetings than you could even handle, right? So we'll, let's talk a bit more about that process of what we did together to get you to a place where your calendar was fully flooded with not just a lot of meetings, but good meetings. Um, yeah. But that's really what allows us to move the needle. Yeah. I mean, I think more than anything, like the conversation cadence was helpful because an understanding that like um, the purpose of LinkedIn messages was not to sell, but was really just to move people to a meeting. So like that was helpful. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, getting access to YouLink was helpful just because I could start to automate things a lot more. Um, and then, you know, the third piece that I, I will just really flag for people is like, don't like, you know, of the 40-ish people that I spoke to, you know, the 15 that I ended up closing were not, like very few of them were like brand, brand new to me, right? So like there were touch points before the actual sale. So a couple of people like I've known before and just were in my network, a couple of people like had subscribed to my mailing list and had listened to my podcast. A couple of people I talked with way back in the fall for other things who like when I reopened it were ready to, to work with me. So I just think, you know, you have to like, um, you have to really get real with yourself about the fact that like, it's very rare that your first experience of someone is going to lead to a sale. Like there is a cultivation period um, and people are going to Google you and they're going to look at your stuff and your, your content and whatever. And like, they're going to talk to people that they may know who know you bef and like all this happens without your knowledge. Right. And so um, I just think, the expectation that you're going to sell a cold person after the first call immediately is like pretty unrealistic. I agree. And this is why I have a Facebook group. This is why I do content because I recognize that sometimes people will buy immediately when I send them a cold message. And then I recognize sometimes it'll take three months before they feel warm enough, or maybe the timing needs to be right at that point. So you're, you're, you know, watering the plants and, and expecting that it's going to take some time before they get there. And on occasion you have a sprout that just gets up really, really quickly. Um, but that is, you know, a good overview of what are the ingredients of a successful launch, right? It's having like a very, very proficient and scalable way of doing outreach. In your case anyways, with high ticket offers in the B2B world, like outreach makes a ton of sense. Um, so instead of doing it manually, we provided you automation so that you could do much, much more at a much more consistent pace. And then you said the conversation cadence, right? How are you actually talking to people in the right way? Not just a salesy, pitchy, spammy way, but a way which actually inspires conversation, gets people to be willing to talk. And then with the people who are willing to talk, can you close them on the day of? Sometimes if you have a very good method of closing that we tried to build, but also in the case that they're not, are you willing to indoctrinate them, cultivate them in your words with content, um, with ongoing touch points? So those are the elements that um, it sounds as though really allowed you to have as good of a launch 
as you did. Tell me if I'm missing anything or if you want to plug in something. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is too, I would just say like when you get on the call, like my focus wasn't necessarily sales. It was really about offering value, right? And like getting them to talk about their thing, offering them some good, you know, good ideas and then kind of leading them naturally to like, okay, well, what, what are the next steps? So I think even though these are people who were familiar with me and had consumed my content or whatever it was, like I, I still really needed to prove the value on the sales call, uh, which then naturally led to like, oh, that like that's such a good idea. What what's the next step here? Yeah, for sure. And um, a sales call should never just be a sales call where you're pitching stuff. That's why we do discovery. That's why we build rapport. That's why we actually build the value of of our solutions. And when we can do that, everything kind of clicks into place. So with that being said, um, why don't you give us some metrics? Um, like how many meetings were you typically doing on a per week basis or even booking on a per week basis and doing on a per week basis? Um, what was your close rate? Like tell us some of the numbers that led you to have the month that you did. Yeah, so here, let me just pull this up because I, I have, this. so I, you know, and the other thing I just want to say, um, for people who are launching and like freaking out. Cause I definitely like was freaking out. So my first, so I opened at Jan four. I had, I think three calls booked that day of the three calls, one person signed on right away. And I was like, yes, this is amazing. Right? Like if it happens like this, I'm going to be done by the end of the month. And then there's that dip where like nobody signs up in the I, I went through what I call like the, 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 the nights of despair. We're like, no one's ever going to buy my stuff. This is going to be terrible. And then like things got a little dust. I was like, Oh God, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Maybe the pricing is wrong. Maybe, like there's a lot of self doubt that crept in. And then, you know, for whatever reason that last week, like I would say the last week and a half, like everyone came in and I was like, Oh, okay. It's, this is cool. It's fine. <laughs> So for folks out there who um, are listening, I would say, you know, have patience and, you know, Lloyd, I think you talked about it, like, you know, trust the process, right? Because the outcome, like you have no control over the outcome, like ultimately you have no control over whether or not people are going to sign on or not. It's just like you have to continue being out there. So, um, so just to give a little bit of context from between March Fourth and the last day of, sorry, January 4th to the last day of January, I had um, 44 calls booked. So, you know, it wasn't like consistently over, but you know, so some days I had like five calls and other days I had three calls, but you know, so that's like three weeks, 44 calls, right? Um, of the 44 calls, I had 15 people sign on. So whatever conversion rate that is, I think it's like forty-four percent. That's solid. I think a lot of people would love to have a forty-four percent conversion rate. So there you go. And I suppose um, the next question that I have is, like you, you obviously joined my program. It's been I don't know, like four months now, five months. I'm not exactly sure. A lot of a lot of those early months was us just like prepping for the launch prepping for the, the strategy, all that good stuff. And then January was when you really just kicked things to high gear and was like fully <laughs> revenue focused. So if you had to try to measure the ROI of our program, granted, it's only been a couple months, like we're gonna continue working together for the next like six months beyond that. So hopefully the ROI only increases. Mm -hmm. But if you had to talk about the ROI that you've had up to this point um, in the first quarter and a half or so of our, you know, partnership, where would you put it if you could attach a number to it, even if it's not like the most accurate? Number? Yeah, I mean, like definitely, um, definitely very high. I, I mean, you know, let's call it like 10x, right? So, you know, I attribute a lot of being able to land this group of people to what we worked on. So even though, like, even though, uh, let's say half of these people are people that I had some kind of prior relationship with, I don't know that without your strategy, I would have been able to like get them signed up for a thing. So, and then the other piece is I, I will also say like of, of that list that I just read to you, one, two, three, like 14 of them said, 
I'm really interested, but just like the timing is not right, but, but let me know. Right. So like, I think that's kind of my next group of people, which is like, Hey, remember when we spoke back in January? So in a sense, like with 14 people who are like, yeah, I'm really interested, but like the timing just isn't right for me. Even if like a third of those convert, you know, that's, that's still a good amount of people to start seeding the next cohort. So, you know, like easily, even within four months, I, you know, 10 X my initial investment with you. Yeah. And hopefully, I mean, this was really just your first month launching for real. If you, if you think about it yeah. and it's not as though you're not going to continue trying to sell, trying to sell you are. Yeah. So um, we've already started working together. We're going to continue building more processes and maybe that 10 X will 10 X again in a couple yeah, months. Well, I'm see. counting on it. Cause like I got big goals. <laughs> Lloyd. Yeah. And, and we still talk all the time. So we're going to try to get you to those big goals ASAP. So at the moment, we have uh, a good amount of people on the live stream. Okay. Here is a time for you to post some questions uh, in the chat, and we're going to actually get to all of them, hopefully before the time runs out. We do have 10, 15-ish minutes. So while everyone just like gets their chance to put the question, and we'll give them like a minute, why don't you just have like a quick overview of what you thought about the, the experience of being in the program? Not as much the tactics or what you learned, but more mm -hmm. about the support, because um, a big focus that we always have with our program is not just providing content, but also a community and support and coaching and all, and all yeah. that good stuff. So um, as people are kind of just like putting in their questions and whatnot, maybe you can share a bit of your experience on what you liked or what you didn't like. You can be totally honest. I wouldn't take offense. Um, so just the experience in terms of working with me and the yeah. rest of the team. The well, look, I mean, I, I, I love working with you, Lloyd. I mean, I've already recommended you to a bunch of people. So, you know, if they come through, I'll let you know. Um, yeah. I mean, I would say I, I appreciate the fact that you have like the weekly call. So even if I don't make it every week, at least I know that like if something comes up and then I can like jump on the call and be like, okay, this is happening. I mean, I will be honest, like for about a month or so, I think I was just whining. Like I think you just had to deal with me like, and then no one's going to buy and then, ah! you know, and it was just helpful to have you be like, it's okay. I do remember that. I remember that month. For sure. I was like, I mean, I think everyone goes through that where they're like, yeah, self okay. but it was just helpful to have someone be like, calm down, stop crying, <laughs> keep going. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I really enjoy um, the folks on the call. I think one thing that would be really helpful is if there was an opportunity to like have deeper relationships with other folks in the program, because I think we're all kind of like in the same space, like trying to figure things out. Um, so to the extent that it's possible to have more, uh, I mean, I think there is a community, but you know, because like people come in and out and like, you don't necessarily know who's gonna be there week to week. It, I think it's a little bit harder to develop uh, a relationship. So I'm, I'm just, I guess I'm just wondering if there's a world where you know, you could do theme things where it's like, hey, if you're like a coach consultant and trying to do this, like this call is for you. And then you can meet other people who are doing that. Or like if you're doing, you know, enterprise sales, like this is for you. Because like some of the times you would get into conversations with like enterprise sales folks. And I was like, this is like totally irrelevant to me. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And we're working on that. We, we have um, a couple of like these like mini tribes, so to speak, in our program where um, because they're in similar in similar industries, I just grouped them together. Like we have four people that are all like doing coaching in the real estate investing space. And they just have like a little uh, group chat um, separately that I'm also a part of because I started it. But I try to do that when I notice people are similar. Unfortunately, yeah. there is no one else that are doing nonprofits. Although maybe we can make a little mini group chat more for just like people selling digital products and whatnot. Yeah. So we could do that because that's relevant to you. Um, but yeah. I'm always happy to take feedback and it's, yeah, I, I want to make the experience always better. Yeah. That being said, we do have some questions and I think people here seem to want to, you know, get deeper into the tactics. So let's do that for them. Let's actually talk a bit more about your daily workflow and all that good stuff. So I'm actually looking at just some of these questions here. Uh, for some reason, it's not showing up all the questions. Do you see the questions on your- I see the questions. Okay, I'm trying to, okay, let's just go through each of these. Um, Anna asks, how many people do you reach out to daily? And um, yeah, why don't you give an answer to that? 
Um, hard to say because Ulink does a lot of it. So um, I think Ulink is set to like reach out to 48 people or something like that. So, I mean, I, I know I should be checking it daily. I don't check it daily. So I batch it. So like every other week or like three times a week, I'll go in and just like batch um, respond to people. But, you know, I obviously here, let me just pull up my Ulink so I give you a sense of like what my... And while you're doing that, Anna actually did ask, what is Ulink? So Ulink is a software that I provide for my clients. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to get access to it. It's totally private. It's um, something that you are only able to get via like a specific invite. Um, but it's just part of what it is that I do for my clients because I want them to be able to automate their process, kind of access to the best in class technology that can help them be more efficient and more effective with their time. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so I think Ulink is, um, they put out about 90 uh, ish requests per day. And then of those requests, 25 ish or so actually respond. And then of that, like, well, I think I have a pretty high response rate, but about 30. Uh, so it's a seven replied to connection message and 27 replied to other messages, but I think that's of the 93, not of the connected. So, you know, I mean, yeah. at the end of the day, like fundraising, it's all a numbers game. The more you're outputting, the more you're booking, the more you're selling. Yeah. And what is your daily workflow? Um, that's, that's another question that Anna has. Um, I mean, it's funny because once you automate a lot of the stuff, the daily workflow can almost be removed from like biz dev to a degree. Yeah. So I, of course, if you're doing it manually, then your daily workflow is just prospecting. But uh, why don't you tell us a bit more about like your daily workflow, um, whether it be the prospecting stuff or if it's totally removed from prospecting because you've automated a lot of the biz dev. Yeah, I don't really do a lot of prospecting work anymore. Um, so thing, right? When you put things on autopilot, I mean, it's so great. It, you know, it, it's yeah. I mean, I think you also have to just like be comfortable with the fact that like sometimes the replies seem kind of automated. So like I'll go in because I've set it to like do three responses if you don't hear back in like a certain period of time, and then off be like stop harassing me. <laughs> like, that's, yeah, just, yeah. that's just auto. I mean, that only happened once. So like. Really, it's fine. Um, and then, you know, the other thing about my sector is like, you know, really nice people work in the sector because, you know, they're trying to change the world. So I think I, I have a like particularly friendly sector. So what, what, what they lack in money, they make up for in uh, niceness. But, um, you know, I, look, my my daily work is really, I, I don't think it it's something that you can take as instructive because it's like, kind of random um, in the sense that like I have my group coaching program, but then I also have legacy clients that I'm doing some consulting work for. So I was like, these are folks I'd signed up back in December before I launched. Cause I was like, Oh, I like if this launch fails, I need some backup um, revenue coming in. So I took their money. <laughs> so now I have to deliver. So, um, you know, February and mid March, I'm just like finishing up with some of my legacy consulting clients. So usually in any given day, so I blocked off Mondays and Fridays as no meeting days so I can get some work done. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays, I usually do a lot of one-on-one -on -one strategy meetings like these discovery calls uh, from connections I've made via LinkedIn. And then Thursdays you know, are a heavy meeting days for me. That's when I do my webinar. And then Friday is my 90 minute coaching session. And then I actually work on the weekend. So like the weekends are usually when I, I film the modules for the coming week. Yeah, and for anyone who's actually curious about the specific process of the LinkedIn stuff, um, first you find the lead. Typically you're using Sales Navigator or some other list building tool. There's a couple. I have preferences on which one to use depending on the circumstance. I'm not going to go any deeper than that because then it gets a bit into like LinkedIn data black hole stuff. But Sales Navigator is like a pretty easy yeah. and accessible one. Um, you find them and then you use uh, the tool that we have talked about before, some automation to plug in. And that way, anyone who you have found as like the ideal prospects from the list building side, you just like send out the message. And then as far as messaging is concerned, um, it's not just a single message. It's like a message sequence over the course of a several 
amount of days, several messages as well. And then um, the messaging itself is like pretty specific. And it's also one of those things that I spend a lot of time with my clients on to build a very, very effective messaging sequence because maybe you guys remember Rhea saying like she had been doing LinkedIn messaging before and it wasn't really working. It's as much in the messaging, right? Even if you're automating and scaling the volume, if the messaging itself sucks and your conversion rate is really low, it doesn't really matter. So like, let's fix the effectiveness of the messaging and then let's add scale so that you can take effective messaging and then ramp it up in terms of volume. Well, and, um, and so that's, part, you know, sorry, just to add, like in your, in your messaging sequence, like the first message you send out is like pretty friendly. It's like, hey, just like stumbled on your name. Like, looks like we're in the same industry. If you ever want to like jump online for virtual coffee, let me know. And that's really just meant to like, gauge engagement but because i have like a very friendly audience like immediately like yeah great let's do a virtual coffee and i was like damn <laughs> uh, yeah yeah i mean i would actually say that most people are a little bit harder to book on a call um and for us we actually had to come up with ways to book less people on a call right because um you were getting too many unqualified people so we, i think we had one or two weeks um, where we were talking mostly about what can we say to uh, filter people out so that they don't want to book a call be with us or book a call with us unless they fit these specific criteria. So it's, it, I think that's why working one-on-one -on -one and having a lot of these calls um, is helpful because we get to customize your approach depending on what you're seeing from the market. Um, but that's, that's really awesome. Uh, Michael is asking here, uh, I didn't quite get what the main tactics were on how you got the 44 calls in the first place. Can you share the top three sources of prospects? Well, I feel as though we technically answer that now. So I'm assuming he asked that before. I yeah, said I, mean, that. Not, I mean, the other thing I, I will say is like, I also have an email list that I've been building, right? So like mm -hmm. I have a 1700 person email list. And so, you know, when I, um, and actually this is a really good point. When I launched this, it wasn't directly like, I'm going to sell this to you directly. I put up an application in order to qualify people to book calls. So it was like an application and it was like, Hey, we'll reach out to you if we, if we feel like this is a fit. And so, um, you know, a good number of those prospects came from, you know, cold prospecting, but it wasn't directly to a call. It was, Hey, here's an application to this accelerator. So they already kind of knew like it was leading up to something. Yeah. Very, very cool. So we have Bruce Wayne asking. <laughs> Bruce Wayne is not his name. Or maybe it is. Uh, he, oh, he's asking, uh, like creating a group for his specific niche. His niche is like computer science and AI. Um, maybe a bit more context would be helpful, like a Facebook group, a LinkedIn group. Like what are, what are we talking about here? I'll just answer it even without the context. LinkedIn groups are pretty useless. Um, I don't think that LinkedIn groups have any value outside of using it as a filter inside Sales Navigator because you can use Sales Navigator and then just find anyone who's inside a group. But then like the actual groups inside LinkedIn are pretty useless. They're not like um, groups on Facebook where there's real engagement. It's just people spamming each other with links. So that's what I would say. So if it's a Facebook group, you can totally make it work. If it's a LinkedIn group, don't waste your time. And that's my thoughts on that yeah when i i will say like i don't even have a group online i, I don't even do that because i a group I, is I, like your podcast right because if you think about a group it's it's really just a place for you to nurture people and indoctrinate them and your version of that your version of getting people to like you more and build trust with you more over the longer period of time is pretty much just your podcast so right. you have something to do the same um to, to arrive at the same intention so right. so to speak even with a different vehicle. Yeah. To I mean, I think the other thing too is just like decide what platform you're going to use. Cause I was like, I just don't have enough time in my day to like do like LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. And it was just like, okay, I've got to like pick one thing. And yeah. it happens that like my audience is on LinkedIn. So that's, I doubled down on that. I agree. And for me, I also started off on LinkedIn first. And only once I solved LinkedIn, I moved to Facebook. And then for me, it's because like my audience hangs out in a lot of places. So it makes sense. But for you, like it's such a higher density on LinkedIn that you might as well just stay there. So I resonate with that. We have a question from Danny, Danny White. Um, he's experiencing overwhelm. He's had a lot of new customers come in to the point that he has to hire people, which congratulations, great problem to have. Um, he has a source of hiring, but he doesn't know how to bring them in, how to train them, 
and juggle that with the amount of tasks that he has going on with his other stuff. So, um, I mean, I don't know if you have like a big team, so whether or not you feel equipped to answer that question, like if you do well, feel to answer it, but if not, I can answer that one. Because well, I uh, so, so I would actually refer to like my, my prior life in running a team, um, which is, you know, be, be really clear about what you're hiring for, have a really clear hiring process. Like I, I used, um, I really like who the A method for hiring uh, in order to do full vetting. Uh, as it is now, though, I just have two freelancers that I work with. So I have a virtual assistant uh, who, you know, is out of Nigeria and she helps with things like scheduling, booking, um, you know, email management, stuff like that. And then I have a social media manager who does all of my like social media for podcasts and um you know, things of that nature, which may not be relevant for you. But yeah, I'm a big fan of like figuring out how to outsource so that you can focus on the highest yield activities, which is revenue generation. I agree with everything that you said. And at some point, you just have to recognize that you are your own biggest bottleneck and you will go insane trying to do everything. And that sometimes you are supposed to take one step back in order to take two steps forward. So maybe that means, you know what, putting revenue and putting sales on hold for a month because you spend time hiring people. And does it suck in that month because you're spending time hiring and training? Yeah, sure. But does it ultimately allow you to have double or triple the capacity later? Yeah, so it's worth it. Don't let your monthly target get in the way of you hitting your yearly target. So that's something that I always buy by and I've had to talk about that same topic to a lot of clients who are in the process of like, especially once you hit the 30K, 40K per month mark, like you could, definitely do 30K per month without any help, but it's getting hard. It's getting to the point where it's pretty hard. Um, and some people are just like, eh, I wanna continuously have 30, 40K months. I don't wanna go back down to 20K months if, even though that's what it's gonna take for them to eventually have 50, 60, 70, 100K months. So, um, but I do agree with what you had said before. Don't just hire randomly, like make sure that you know exactly who you're trying to hire for. Make sure that before you hire them on, you know exactly how you're going to be interviewing them, how you're going to be onboarding them. Make sure that when they join, you have the ability to set them up for success and that you're not just assuming they're going to figure it out on their own because they're not going to. Um, so this is something that I talk about a lot more with my clients internally. Um, some of my clients, some of my biggest clients who are coming in already at the seven figure level, they come on just because they want to figure out how to hire. Um, so if that's you, we should definitely talk because is a big part of what we do. And for me, like our team right now is uh, six people and uh, four of them are full time. So we have a process and we need to make sure that when you do bring on people that you don't end up screwing things up because a bad hire is a very expensive mistake. Because not only do you spend a lot of time hiring them, but then they come in and they waste your time because you're trying to manage them and they're not getting managed properly. And then they ultimately waste leads or they waste other things within your organization and then you fire them and you got to hire someone else and go through the process all over again. So like a bad hire, very expensive mistake. So yeah, I mean, a bad hire is like three X their salary. So every hire that you bring on, you, you have to really vet them, which is not to say like you're going to get a hundred percent hit rate. I mean, the other thing I, I will say is like when thinking about hires, think about the ROI for them. Like if you bring this person on, will they free up time for you to like, 3x or 6x the revenue that you're bringing in or maybe they're a salesperson which would then like directly tie to the ROI but you know every every person should be additive in some way yeah for sure I feel like this was awesome we we more or less covered an hour we had like a good amount of questions I feel like we talked about a ton so why don't we um, just end off here and I'll give you the last word what is it that you think if you had to provide a takeaway for people who are thinking about either joining our program um, or just thinking about in general business and life and whatever, um, what, what do you have to say? Um, you know what? I, I work with Lloyd. The, the proof is in the pudding. You know, um, I signed on, you know, it was a significant investment for me, but I think you have to invest in your business and Lloyd knows his stuff. Uh, and then I would also say, trust the process, right? Because I, I definitely, there were minute, moments of doubt where I was like, no one's going to buy. I'm, I'm going to have to go back to consulting. This is going to be terrible. But you know what, Lloyd, your tactics work, your strategies worked, and I had the best month I ever had. So there you go. Love it. 
All right, I'll see y'all on the other side. If you do want to talk to me, you know where to find me. Just send me a DM and my team will, of course, make sure that we end up having that conversation. So with that being said, have a great rest of the week, guys. It's a Thursday, so you have one day left, day and a half left, I guess. And uh, yeah, smash it. Have a great rest of the year. Ciao. Thanks, guys.